Dear Jewel, I left you with a few things to always hold on to. Loyalty, elusiveness, and brute force. If you remember these lessons, you will survive. If anyone can, it's you. Love you always, Dad. Xbox One S, starting at $299. Final Fantasy games have always been emotional affairs. You laugh, you cry, you get really angry, but let's focus on that crying part. Here are 10 moments from throughout the series that trashed your emotions and broke your heart. We couldn't list the 10 saddest moments in Final Fantasy without this iconic moment. While trying to summon Holy so Cloud's gang can save the world, Sephiroth skewers poor Aerith just as she finishes praying. To add insult to injury, not only is our hero seconds away from saving her, when Aerith dies you lose all the materia you had equipped her with. We revisit this moment again and again in the film Advent Children, where Cloud is repeatedly visited by Aerith's spirit as she guides him in his fight against the Sephiroth clones. And who didn't burst into tears at the end as she walked away into the light of the life stream? Tragic. Black Mage Vivi struggles with the meaning of life. After watching the senseless slaughter of the Black Mage army, Vivi comes to believe that life is expendable, only to learn soon after that it's also not permanent. One Black Mage describes how another stopped moving. He says, quote unquote, Mr. 36 is buried under the ground now, but I don't understand why. He's going to come out again one day, right? Vivi learns that death is not just for the sick and injured. Death comes for us all. His existential crisis is powerful and a little frightening. And although he eventually comes to believe that life is precious and what you make of it is up to you, watching his journey to this point is heartrending. Orin is the stoic guardian of Titus and then Yuna. You journey with him for 40 plus hours until suddenly, horrifyingly, you learn that he's actually been dead this whole time. In his younger days, Orin went on a pilgrimage with Yuna's father Braska to defeat the evil entity Sin. But because nothing is ever easy, at the end of the journey, Braska and his other guardian, Titus's father Jax, sacrificed their lives to bring ten more years of peace to the world. Not having any of it, Orin confronted Unaleska, the powerful undead summoner who carried out the sacrifices. Furious with his questioning, Unaleska dealt Orin a fatal blow to the head. He died, but did not move on. He stayed on this plane, a living ghost, unable to rest until Titus and Yuna succeeded in defeating Sin. This is your world now. Following Kefka's destruction of the world, Seles wakes up on an empty island with her adopted father, Sid. Sid cares for Seles as he himself becomes sick and weak. What happens to Sid next can go one of two ways. Playing as Seles, you catch different kinds of fish to feed him. Feed him the fastest fish and he'll get well. But if you only catch the slow-moving, weaker fish, Sid will die. And if Sid dies, you're shown a cutscene where Seles climbs to the top of a nearby cliff in tears and throws herself off in a suicide attempt. She survives and wakes up on the beach, but oh man is it rough to watch. It's very rare for such a mainstream game to tackle suicide at all, and you can feel Sele's pain. Her despair at losing everyone she loves is so great, she just can't make herself go on. Paladin Cecil's ragtag band of heroes are joined by Palum and Porum, two prodigal five-year-old mages. After a particularly grueling battle against the archfiend Cagnazzo, the group is caught in a trap as the walls around them begin to cave in. To save them all, Palum and Porum turn themselves to stone, preventing the walls from closing in any further and allowing Cecil and his companions to escape. You can't heal them, you can't remove them, they're just statues. The fact that these kids are barely out of their toddler stage coupled with the whole thing happening very abruptly is just soul crushing. Even though they reappear later in the game, fully healed by the mysterious Elder, this doesn't diminish the gut punch of watching them sacrifice themselves. Palum. Porum. When his son Dodge turns to Crystal following the fulfillment of his Lassie focus, Saz breaks. But then he learns why his son was branded a Lassie to begin with. Vanille and Fang tried to kill a foul sea, and the entity branded Dodge in an effort to protect itself. 
Up to this point, Saz has been protecting Vanille, essentially his son's killer by association, with his life. Then Saz really breaks and turns his gun on Vanille, but she doesn't run. When she says she doesn't know how to atone for what has happened, Saz drops his weapons and resolves to die. Then an Edolin appears, a creature that will kill any Lassie who tries to die. These scenes are lore-heavy, and it's easy to get lost in the proper nouns of Final Fantasy XIII's world, but that doesn't diminish the power of watching these characters struggle to find hope. Okay, fine. You want me? Come and get me! We learned in Final Fantasy VII that Zack died fighting Shinra soldiers. In prequel Crisis Core, published a decade after the original game, you get to participate in this moment. You play through the entire game knowing that at the end, Zack will die. And as you play through his last stand, the controls literally stop working on you. No amount of button smashing does anything. Everything just spins out of control, and just as you come to terms with the fact that you're fighting a final boss battle that is destined to end in failure, it's done. Zack, riddled with bullets, passes his sword to Cloud and dies. You knew this was coming, but having to actually live through it? Brutal. Sky Pirate Redis was once a powerful Judge Magister, but after being manipulated by the scientist Dr. Sid to activate a super weapon and decimate an entire city, he left his title behind, tortured by what he'd done. Throughout the game, Redis offers counsel to Ash and her crew, as well as some backup muscle. He accompanies the party to find the Sun Crist, a stone that will grant Ash an untold amount of destructive power. Once there, the party learns that the stone has already been activated and is powering the Final Fantasy XII equivalent of the Death Star. Redis eventually sacrifices himself in destroying the Sun Crist, opening the way for the team to confront the game's final boss. Redis didn't have to, but chose to die, which already makes this tragic. But after all you've been through with him in the game, it's tough to cope with his sudden absence. I, Judge Magister. The last we see of Laguna in Final Fantasy VIII, he's standing at his wife's grave. After losing out on his first love, Laguna marries Rain, who nurses him back to health after a botched war expedition. Laguna is called off again when sorceress Adele kidnaps Elone, Rain's adopted daughter. Laguna leaves not knowing his wife is pregnant, and after eventually saving Elone and defeating Adele, he sends the girl home to her mother and then becomes president for some reason. Rain, meanwhile, dies giving birth to her son, heavily implied to be hero Squall, and her two children are sent to an orphanage. Laguna never sees Rain again, and he loses nearly everything he's ever loved. In the end sequence, we see him visiting Rain's grave and reliving his proposal to her. After a lifetime of heartache, that's all that's left for Laguna in the end. Talk about a total downer. Final Fantasy Tactics is literally just one big series of really unfortunate events. It begins with death, ends with death, and nobody is happy. Jesus, Final Fantasy Tactics. What moments from the Final Fantasy series really broke your heart? Let us know in the comments below, and for all your Final Fantasy news, stick to GameSpot.com.